it's a Christianity that has practically nothing to do with the, the traditional uh, teachings of 2,000 years. It certainly has, uh, has nothing to do with the Jesus of the Bible. But I now recognize that Jesus actually taught me Christ consciousness. One of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way. All right, our subject is New Age Tower of Babel. And we began in the last session looking at how that the New Age is infiltrating Christianity. First of all, through interfaith ecumenical activities, through the positive thinking movement, through the charismatic movement, through the contemplative mystical movement, and I would like to spend a lot more time on that, but there's an entire book on that subject on the table, Contemplative Mysticism, a powerful uh, end-time ecumenical glue bond. But tonight we want to think about how that the New Age movement has infiltrating Christianity through the holistic health movement. Holistic health movement. There's nothing wrong with trying to maintain a healthy diet and lifestyle. But the holistic health movement today is dangerously permeated with New Age demonic concepts. It's also called a natural medicine, complementary health care, alternative medicine, spiritual health care, Brian Snyder, when, I, when we first began to do this research last year and uh, write the new book on this title, he observed that health food stores today are like New Age chapels. In 1992, only 2% 2 of the medical schools in North America had a course in spirituality. By 2004, it was 67%. The Mayo Clinic's website, you'll find uh, uh, information about touch therapy, yoga, tai chi, acupuncture, cupping, biofeedback, and hypnosis, all new age practices. And there are many misconceptions on this particular subject. Some think uh, that the holistic health movement is simply about the wise use of natural healing properties found in nature and the body itself. And it's though much more than that. Some say, well, we, we should be able to eat the fish and spit out the bones. I can go into, into this uh, field and I can dabble around with it. And, and I won't be hurt because I'll just uh, reject the things that are wrong. One problem with that thinking is that, that we're dealing with the devil. He's subtle. Very clever. He deceived Eve. The average Christian is not capable of exercising the keen spiritual discernment that's necessary to reject that which is wrong in this very subtle field of error. Randall Bear, he's a former naturopathic doctor, said, I see this field as being a mixture of positive and negative three ingredients of wholesome and six ingredients of new age, the holistic healthcare field. Three ingredients of wholesome and six ingredients of new age. That's worse than rat poison, folks. In this tricky, subtle, holistic health field, discernment is at a premium. In other words, it's very needed, but it's also very lacking even in God's churches. Some think that since the holistic practitioner cares for me, he will not lead me astray. One thing that's very attractive about holistic health care practitioners is that they show a lot of empathy usually, whereas the average doctor doesn't. I went uh, on the last trip to the States back in April. I was having trouble with my eyes, and I went to have them checked at a, you know, a Walmart type of a little 
situation, he said, no, you need to go to the real doctor over at the hospital. So I was able to make an appointment that very day, and I went in, and, and it was a, a Jewish doctor. I remember this because it was the, the Jew, Israel was celebrating its anniversary that month, and she didn't even know about it. I was very amazed at that. She was from Israel. But anyway, she's very, very, very highly trained, but she could care less about me. You could tell that. I mean, there was just no empathy at all. It was just all business, and let's get this over and get the next one in here. But, but the holistic healthcare practitioners tend to uh, express a lot of empathy and caring about you and finding out maybe about your situation. It's attractive to a lot of people. But you know, the witch at Endor was very empathetic towards Saul. Saul fainted there. He, was, he wasn't even going to eat. He was just going to die right there on the floor when the witch of Endor and Samuel appeared to him and he realized that he was dealing with the, you know, this situation and Saul was so distracted and distraught and, and she just encouraged him and fed him and, and helped him out of that situation. Very empathetic. She was a witch. Many think that the alternative health care, yeah, there's a lot of problems. There, there's occultic things there and different things. But, but they can't really hurt the National Council Against Health Fraud warns that, quote, quacks rob us of our money, our dignity, our health, and our lives. And Dr. David Sneed, medical doctor, he, he's written a book called The Hidden Agenda, A Critical View of Alternative Medical Therapies. But he, ha he says that some possible dangers of alternative health care is our failure to diagnose properly diagnose what you have, failure to treat, failure to properly treat what you, what's wrong with you, emotional harm, wasted money, toxic effects from their prescriptions, and loss of reality. One woman was instructed to apply a castor oil pack to her abdomen for her abdominal pain. It turned out she had appendicitis and needed surgery. That castor oil pack was not going to get the job done. A cancer patient was treated with alternative therapy for 14 months. Diagnosed with cancer, decided, well, I'll go over here to the alternative out, uh, 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 therapy situation. Long enough for her breast cancer to spread so widely that too late. One little girl's nervous system was permanently damaged. Another infant died after her parents gave them high doses of vitamin A and potassium as recommended by Adele Davis in her book, Let's Have Healthy Children. 50,000 to 75,000 Americans took latrial treatments for cancer, which turned out to be bogus. and Many died from the toxicity of the treatment not to speak of their cancer. One woman was diagnosed with colitis and gallbladder disease. She pursued an alternative remedy of coffee enemas and became so depleted of essential electrolytes that she suffered a seizure and died. Totally unnecessary. It was the alternative treatment that killed her. Another misconception is that it's God's will that we be healthy. A lot of people buy into this. And if we just follow a natural, a proper natural plan, we will not be sick. That's not true. It's not true. In the book, Be in Health by Henry Wright, they say, we are dedicated to the eradication and prevention of all spiritual, psychological, and biological disease. All of it. Just got to follow our plan. Bill Gother has his total health program. Total health program. If you just follow the plan, you'll be totally healthy. 
Liar. In the Bible, we see that God did not always heal believers that were sick. When Timothy was sick so often, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 23, we read about his life and he was his often infirmities. He was sick a lot. He was a preacher. Why didn't Paul just say, look, we got a health program. We got a diet. We got a, reg a regimen for you. You don't have to be sick like this all the time, Timothy. He didn't say that. He said, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake and your often infirmities. When Trophimus was sick in 2 Timothy 4.20, why didn't Paul put him on an alternative care health regimen? When Paul himself was sick, afflicted in 2 Corinthians 12, God said, no, it's my plan for you to be sick. I don't want you to become proud. You're going to have to bear this. We live in a cursed world. This promise that we can not be sick and we can be perfectly healthy if we just follow this and that program is a denial of the fact that we don't live in paradise anymore. I wish we did, but we don't. You can look around and see that, and you can read the Bible and see that, where all of this trouble came from in Genesis chapter 3, when the man and the woman blatantly broke God's law and ate of the tree that they were commanded not to eat of, and the curse was placed upon this earth because of man's sin. And, and ever since, man has been dying, and every man dies. Name me one that hasn't. Jesus Christ died on the cross, but he rose from the dead. Every man has died. And you'll die. And I'll die. I don't care what program you follow. Unless Jesus comes first. It's not true. There is a, there is a matter of eating wisely, using good sense, but this idea that you don't have to be sick ever and you can be healthy if you just followed a certain plan is absolutely a lie. Another misconception is that the Bible lays out the ideal diet. That ideal Bible diet. George Malcolmus has his hallelujah diet supposedly based on the early part of the Bible, vegetarian diet, excuse me. Don Colbert has his what would Jesus eat diet. Well, he'll eat, eat lamb, I'll tell you that much. What would Jesus eat? Gwen Shawlin has her way down workshops. Reuben, uh, Jordan Rubin has the maker's diet. God's diet that God gave us in the Bible. From Adam to Noah, men were vegetarians. We read about that in Genesis 1, 29 and 30. After Noah, men ate meat. Praise the Lord. Genesis 9, 3. All those tasty critters. Under Moses, Israel ate meat. Israel ate meat. They had certain strict diet of clean and unclean, but they were meat eaters. Jesus lived under the law, and Jesus, we know, ate fish. Luke 24, 42, and 43. And we know that Jesus ate lamb, that good tasted lamb. Exodus 12, 6, and 8, he kept the Passover. In the church age, we are taught that the old dietary restrictions are gone. Thank the Lord. Acts, 10, 9, uh, 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 Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16, Peter uh, died in the wool Jew that believed in a very strict kind of diet. You can't eat this, you can eat that. God lowered down in a vision from heaven in a net a whole 
slew of unclean animals and said to Peter, Rise up and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, which is not the right answer. <laughs> and so God repeated that three times. Unclean animals, Peter, rise up and eat. Yes, God was speaking to him about the Gentiles and the fact that God loves the Gentiles and, God, and the gospel was to be preached to the Gentiles. But God was also saying this old thing about the unclean and clean animals, that, that's passing away now. You can eat those animals. The pig. You can eat that pig. Peter was commanded to rise up and eat that. There were pigs in that net, folks. And in Romans 14, we are told not to judge in exactly the matter of diet. That is what Paul was talking about in Romans 14. Some believe they can eat meat. Others believe that they, they can't. They only eat vegetables. Vegetables. If I'm going to be one or the other, I'm going to be all the meat eater. Just, just eat the meat. It's better than vegetables. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know you have a balanced diet. I'm all for a balanced diet. Really, I am. You have your balanced diet. <laughs> We're not to judge specifically about eating. We're not supposed to judge one another. And in 1 Timothy 4, in fact, Paul warned that the idea that forbidding to eat meats is a doctrine of devils. That's dangerous stuff. Doctrine of devils is forbidding to eat meat, which the Roman Catholic Church has done through the centuries. It's where the old practice of just eating fish on Friday comes from. But Paul said, under divine inspiration, that all, all, everything's good. It would be eaten with thanksgiving. And so there's the idea that the Bible lays out the ideal healthy diet, the Bible diet. And there is also the misconception that if a product is accompanied by glowing testimonies, it must be good. But you know, we live in a world of lies. So we have to test testimonies. And uh, some good tests of testimonies are these. First of all, the patient must actually have the disease he's testifying of being healed from. That, that, charismatics have a big problem with that. I was healed. No, you didn't ever have it. <laughs> And also, the claimed cure must result from the therapy. I was healed, yeah, but what healed you? Was it that alternative therapy, or is it just that, something else? You know, I, I saw one time advertised a tonic for weight loss. And according to that advertisement, you had to do this. You had to not eat for I think it was four hours before you went to bed. And then you also took this tonic and you would lose this weight, guaranteed. And I thought to myself, if you just don't eat four hours before and you don't drink any tonic, you're gonna lose weight. And don't just pork out on potato chips and stuff just before you go to bed, maybe a hamburger. You, you stop that, you're gonna lose weight. That tonic is probably doing nothing. A lot of deception involved in these advertisements. Also, the disease must actually be cured rather than in remission. And also, the patient must be alive. <laughs> That's important. Many times people have testified that they've been healed and they died soon after that. That's not a good testimony. William Branham, the very famous Pentecostal healer, was guilty had a lot of that kind of thing happen in his meetings. And the people would, he would say, you're healed. And the people would stand up and, 
and they would say, I'm healed, and then they died. That's not good healing. And that happens often in the alternative therapy field. So we have to test the glowing testimonies that accompany these cures and remedies and diet programs. And also there's the idea that if it's natural, it must be good. Well, poisons are natural, just as natural as they can be. And then there's the idea that only natural things are proper. But in reality, everything's natural. We've got one world, everything comes from it. God has given man the authority to subdue the earth, Genesis 1.28. The Bible says in James 1.17 that every, every good gift is from above. You go to Nepal, live in the villages there. Many of them, half of the children die before age five. Life expectancy is 40 years old. They die every day of things that people with modern medicine routinely survive. But they have a lot of natural stuff. Dr. David Sneed says, The fact is, nature is fallen, according to the Bible. Expelled from paradise, man has had to learn to rest from nature, good farming land, tolerable living conditions, and disease-fighting drugs. A gracious God has given us both the raw material and the ability to develop such techniques as modern science. We deny ourselves such gifts in a misguided attempt to return to a naive concept of nature. I don't believe modern science is God. Modern science is not divine. They make many mistakes. We don't blindly follow doctors. But God has given modern scientists an amazing amount of wisdom that we benefit from every day. Now, how can we tell whether an alternative health care practice is, is, is something we could use or if it's dangerous spiritually? Here's some warning signs. When a practice enters into the realm of the occult, it is forbidden by God's Word. And the first warning sign is that if they are teaching something about a metaphysical life for, force energy, it is occultic. Metaphysical life force energy that supposedly flows through everything, flows through your body and has to be manipulated. It's called many things. It's called chi and ki and prana. But it's purely occultic. There's no biological basis. And there's no biblical basis for believing that such a thing exists at all. And yet it, this, this metaphysical life force energy lies at the heart of yoga, Eastern massage, Reiki, Feng Shui, Tai Chi, Qigong, acupuncture, acupressure, cupping, polarity therapy, Magnetic therapy, biofeedback, reflexology, iridology, Ayurveda, homeopathy, and many aspects of chiropractic. They talk about the transference of this energy that has a, a huge part of the whole field of what they call body work. is simply the supposed manipulation of this energy acupuncture, chiropractic, polarity therapy. Not all chiropractics practitioners believe this, but most of them do. Polarity therapy, reflexology, Reiki, Rolfing, therapeutic touch, touch for health. The Harper's Encyclopedia of Mystical and Paranormal, a paranormal Experience says, body work therapies assume the existence of a universal life force that affects your health, which can be stimulated by the therapy. Psychic abilities sometimes develop over the course of time. Patients sometimes report experiences such as past life recall and clairvoyance, which is a loud warning that we're dealing with the occult here. You start past lives starting to be dredged up. There is no past life. You don't have a past life. 
So the first warning sign is that if this practice has anything to do with a supposed metaphysical life force energy, it is occultic. The second warning sign is if it deals with something called humors. It goes back to ancient Greek cosmology. Supposedly there's four elements, fire, air, water, and earth. And these four elements supposedly have corresponding humors in the body. And an imbalance in these humors results in sickness. And so to be well, you simply have to get the humors back into balance. And the humor practitioners prescribe various, but it's pure occultism. It's pure hocus pocus. Warning sign number three is if the practice involves visualization, such as the tile water method. Now this I read about in a book by a Roman Catholic named John Michael Talbot in his book, Come to the Quiet. It's a book on mysticism. And he says, lift your hands above your head, begin slowly moving your hands down your body. As you sense or feel a blockage, stiffness, or pain, visualize it as hard, cold ice. Allow it to turn from ice to fluid water. Then allow the water to vaporize and lift out of your body and out of your outer energy. When you exhale, send it far away from you. Continue down your body doing this wherever you feel a blockage or pain. That is pure occultism or pure fantasy, one or the other. The visualization and the power of the visualization. And then warning sign number four, if the practice involves hypnosis, it is occultic. Hypnosis is an induced altered state of consciousness in which the subject becomes passive and responsive to suggestion. Alternate state of consciousness. Estimated 20,000 specialists in North America use it. They use it for pain relief, for anesthesiology, for abuse treatment, weight control, birth control, sleep therapy, physical healing, psychological healing, self-improvement, human potential, but it is purely occultic. It comes out of the occult. Its origins go back to Emanuel Swedenborg. And he wrote under hypnotic trance and the channeling of spirits. And then Anton Mesmer in the 19th century. Mesmerism. Hypnosis came out of the, his practices and his students such as Andrew Jackson Davis communed with spirits in a trance and then would prescribe uh, cures. Hypnosis, occultism. 20% of people that get involved in hypnosis experience past lives. It's, it's, it's occultic. The Bible warns us to stay away from anything like that. Warning sign number five, if that practice involves meditation, it is occultic and dangerous. Meditation. In, in 1987, USA Today reported that meditation is reaching the USA's mainstream. It's an integral part of the new age. Meditation and entering into an altered state of consciousness. And then warning sign number six, if that alternative health care involves practices from the field of psychoanalysis, such as dream interpretation, very popular, or regression therapy and going back and trying to recover past lives, it is occultic. We must stay away from it. Many, many of these occultic practices have become popular just in the last couple decades. Reiki. Reiki, R-E-I-K-I. USA, U.S. News and World Report at this year said that there's Reiki practitioners worldwide in the millions. And it's supposed to channel the universal healing energy by touch. And Reiki masters learn how to supposedly attune themselves with their Reiki energy 
and then channel it to others to, for healing. And many of the Reiki practitioners communicate with spirits. It's taught in the Reiki master schools. In Hindu bookstores in Nepal, shelves are full of books on Reiki. And then you have Ayurveda. Ayurveda, very popular in North America today. Supposedly came down from the Hindu gods. Deepak Chopra, a Hindu from India, medical doctor, has popularized this. But it's Hinduism. They say that Ayurveda has a very basic, very simple kind of approach. That is that we are part of the universe and the universe is intelligent and the human body is part of the cosmic body and the human mind is part of the cosmic mind. And, uh, and, and, and if we align everything properly through yoga and mantras and acupuncture and aromatherapy and sound therapy and color therapy and gym therapy and astrology, we'll be perfectly well. Ayurveda, it's Hinduism. And then you have homeopathy. Homeopathy, invented by a man named Samuel Hahnemann, who was a practitioner of Hinduism and Eastern religion and philosophy and a, dabbled in the occult. But according to homeopathy, you take this highly dissolved, diluted medicine, but it has been diluted so much that it is water. And they say in Radisson, don't drink the water. <laughs> the Swiss Journal of Homeopathy says that the homeopathic cure has an occultic mind of its own. Well, I don't want to mess with it then. Then you have reflexology and the body supposedly is divided into zones. It's called zone therapy. And the areas of the foot supposedly correspond with certain areas of the body. And by applying pressure to certain parts of the foot, then you can bring healing to that corresponding part of the body. Reflexology. And then you have acupuncture. Comes from the east, comes from Asia. Eastern philosophy, and according to acupuncture, there are meridians that flow, that, that allow the flow of the occultic energy in your body. And that energy is called chi. And a disharmonious flow has to be brought back into harmony through acupuncture. But it's all about this mystical, metaphysical, non-existence energy. Then you have chiropractic. There are 70,000 licensed chiropractors in America alone. It was developed by Daniel Palmer, who was an occultist and practiced magnetic healing by trance. And he believed that there is an intelligent energy that flows through the body called innate. Sounds a lot like chi. And that it is connected to the universal intelligence and flows through the nervous system and can be blocked. And the chiropractic en enables it to be unblocked as the body is manipulated and so that the body can maintain its innate healing abilities. The early chiropractic, uh, Palmer and the early chiropractitioners were opposed to vaccination and the germ doctrine of infectious disease. And many of them still are that foolish. Chiropractic has branched into all sorts of occult practices today. George Goodhart invented applied kinesiology. 
Werner Jensen invented iridology. That's uh, making the body well through examining the eye. Scott Walker invented neuroemotional technique. John T. invented touch for health. John Diamond invented behavioral kinesiology. These are very occultic practices, all invented by chiropractitioners. And the reason that classic chiropractic is, is so open to this occultic area is because it originally was based on occultic principles. And this idea of the flow of innate. There's different types of practitioners today, and not all of them believe in the occultic realm and the idea of an innate, but many of them do. And then you have microbiotics, extreme diet, a vegetarian, largely vegetarian diet. But it's not just a diet, it's a whole philosophy of life. It focuses on eating whole cereal grains supplemented with vegetables and beans and legumes. And a core teaching invented by a Japanese man is that God and nature and the universe are all one. And we can also be one through the right kind of diet and lifestyle, one with nature, one with God. And they divide foods into the yin and yang categories. Yin and yang. And that you have to balance the yin and the yang, and therefore you have to eat certain things and not eat certain things and get your yin and yang just right. And the kind of food that have too much yin are tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, potatoes, spinach, beets, avocados, sugar, coffee, honey, chocolate, commercial milk, cheese, hot spices, fruit, cream, and yogurt. Too much yin. On the other hand, there's too much yang, in the poultry, meat, and eggs. But according to the Bible, God gave Israel a land flowing with milk and honey and fruit. The microbiotic practitioner finds himself caught up in a whirlpool of legalism. Can't eat that, can't, eat, can't touch that, can't smell that. Not only are they told what to eat, but even how to eat it. You got to chew it 50 times, 100 times, wear your jaws out. <laughs> how many times a day to eat it, how to cook it. And then you have naturopathy, applied kinesiology, that's muscle testing. You ever heard of that? I've got some friends that they go and do it. And to find out what the body needs, if it needs uh, certain uh, 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 supplements, then you do the muscle testing because they say that the muscles have a, a weakness there if there's a certain deficiency. And so you might hold an iron tablet in your hand or put it on your tongue. And then they do the muscle testing. And if it's weak there, Yep, you need that iron tablet. By the way, I can sell you that iron tablet. It's called applied kinesiology. There's more to it, but that's the heart of it, is the muscle testing. In the New Age Tower of Babel, in that book, we go into these things in, in much detail. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10, Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. God warns us about dabbling with anything that is in the, in the devil's field, the realm of the occult. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 10, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination of the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God shall doth drive them out from before thee. In Jeremiah 10, verse 2, we see the same thing. In Jeremiah 10, verse 2, it 
Very powerful statement here by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Learn not the way of the heathen. We have much more wisdom than the heathen. And we don't have to follow their ways. We live in light, not in darkness. And so God says, don't learn their ways. Don't imitate them. Don't do what they do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19, In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 19, What shall I say then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. The Bible warns us that there are devils in this world. And that it's possible to fellowship with them by dabbling with their things. And God says, don't fellowship with devils. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? It's a powerful warning about dabbling in the things of the devil. In Ephesians 5, verse 11, I like this verse. It has very far-reaching implications. It's a very helpful verse if you really want to walk carefully and safely through this wicked world. In Ephesians 5, verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. How much fellowship are we supposed to have? No, no fellowship but rather reprove them. They say, well, religion is personal, private matters. But here God says, reprove them. Speak up. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, what about diet? We alluded to it, but let's read it. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What are these devils going to say? Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. That is one of the doctrines of devils, forbidding to marry. That's a doctrine of devils. God says marriage is good. And commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. That's why God made animals, to eat. That's what the Bible says. Made them to eat, they're tasty. I've eaten lots of kinds of animals. I've eaten turtle. I've eaten bear. Bear's tasty. It's like pork. I've eaten deer and elk. I've eaten snake. I've eaten... I wanted to eat dog. I've been to Korea. Every time I've gone there, I've vowed to eat some dog. I've purposed to eat some dog. In the restaurants, you buy dog. But each time I forgot. <laughs> I'd eat dog. Tasty little dog. <laughs> I've eaten frogs, frog legs, very tasty. I've never eaten a cat. I don't know where they sell cats. I'm sure cats are tasty. But here it says, <laughs> for every creature of God is good. 
That's what it says. I don't know where to draw the line with that one. But obviously it's a personal matter. Nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. If you can't receive it with thanksgiving, you shouldn't eat it. For it is sanctified by the word of, word of God and prayer. And now look at verse 8. And this also applies to the field of alternative health and the whole issue of health. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So there is profit in bodily exercise, and there is a body, and we need to take care of the body God's given us. We need to use reasonableness and, and, and common sense about how we live and eat. But that should not be our focus. Because we're here for a short time, and then there is what is called the long home. And that should be our focus. Having promise of that, the life that now is, and that which is to come. And so this idea that there is a Bible diet that I can't eat meat or I can't eat pork or uh, this and that, and the hallelujah diet, all this, it's, it, you cannot support it from the Bible. If you want that diet, help yourself. Help yourself. It's a personal issue. But it cannot be made into a law. And according to Romans 14, verse 23, if in doubt, we should not do something. In Romans 14, verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so if we doubt something, we should not do it. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so there, one way that the new age is really sweeping into Christianity and even fundamentalist type churches is through the holistic health field. And there are many dangers there. There are many occultic practices there that we need to be aware of and we need to avoid. Do you know for sure tonight that you're saved? Do you know for sure? If we die, it's not going to matter what we ate. It's going to matter whether we're in heaven or hell. Are you sure tonight that you're saved? We talked this afternoon, we talked this morning about some that grew up in fundamentalist homes. And then they went further and further and further away from the truth. And in, in many cases, it's because they never were truly born again. Could your parents tonight stand up and testify before this congregation that they have confidence that you, their child, is born again because of the change they've seen in your life? Could your husband stand up and testify that about you? The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. There's going to be a change toward godliness, a change in attitude toward this book, a change in my relationship with God. Could your wife stand up tonight and testify before this congregation? I, I have no doubt. I am confident my husband is saved because I, I see his life. I see it in his life. Are you sure you, tonight that you're saved? I praise the Lord for churches like this. And there still are many churches like this all across the world, thank God, that take a stand for the Word of God. And a man can preach the Word of God, and as long as he's preaching the Word of God, he might not get a lot of amens, but they won't kick him out. I thank the Lord for that. And, the, the, and if we're going to continue to have that, we've got to have the next generation and the next generation to follow in our footsteps. And the foundational issue is, 
Are you really saved? And if you really have the Spirit of God, then the Spirit of God speaks to and leads you and gives you convictions and gives you love for the truth. God bless you, Pastor.